Batman the Animated Series is to this day revered as one of the greatest animated series that ever came out. And a lot of us have always wondered why it never continued. Well, eventually, DC got around to doing a true continuation of it in the form of a comic book, exploring a lot of modern-day Batman ideas and how they would appear in the animated series, such as Deathstroke, Red Hood, and these various characters. A long time ago, we covered each of the individual arcs involved in this storyline, and today, I want to bring you the full story of that. You see, we're comic historian. I do audio dramas of your favorite comic books. We give you like an audio narration of all the cool stuff happening within the world of comics. And today we're gonna bring you one of our full story series, which is just us combining the playlist for you. So today is Batman The Adventure Continues. Batman leaps through the moonlit night swinging through the air, descending upon Bane. But as the villain tries to fight, he suddenly drops to the ground, unconscious. Batman reaches down and picks up the dart of the sedative that hit Bane 30 minutes ago, promising to use a higher dose next time. He suddenly is distracted as he turns to see a massive robot terrorizing the citizens of Gotham City. So he leaps after the giant robot, following it through the city on his grappling hook. And from the shadows, a strange man watches him. I forgot how much fun Gotham could be. Meanwhile, the robot breaks through the wall of Wayne Enterprises, opening fire on the nearby scientists scattering them. It reaches down for a strange vault that has been plugged into the computer, but Batman leaps through the hole in the wall, confronting the robot. Put it back! He orders the machine, and the robot regards him for a moment before opening fire. But with Batman distracted, the robot punches through the wall and exits. Batman follows, throwing more batterings, but the robot kicks a truck at him, leaping into the air, flying away. Round one. Batman thinks to himself. It's the next night that finds Bruce still trying to track the robot's flight pattern. He explains to Alfred that the robot had no visible means of propulsion that he could track. Alfred nods as he holds up a suit for Bruce to wear to tonight's gala. But the vigilante refuses, wishing to focus on his work, and Alfred just smiles. But I haven't told you about the surprise guest. It is later that we find Bruce standing on a decorated rooftop, trying to once again thwart the advances of Veronica Virlin. Luckily, the pair are interrupted by Lex Luthor, who walks over and explains to Veronica that she is wasting her time with Bruce Wayne. He smiles at her, wishing to have a moment alone with Bruce. So the two talk for a moment, with Bruce commenting that Lex normally informs him when he's going to be in town. And the billionaire explains that he is merely there for a few days, says he doesn't like the city after the last time of dealing with the Joker and Batman. Lex smiles, pointing out that he heard Batman wasn't very effective last night. Bruce nods asking if he could have the number for Superman in case the city needs help. Wouldn't help. He hasn't been around lately. Lex tells him, and the two chat for a few more minutes before Lex finally walks away. So later that night, Batman sits at the back computer and once again tries to call Clark, and he gets no answer. He puts on his cowl, promising Alfred that if Superman had heard the news, he would have already arrived to help. He stalks towards the Batmobile, having a good idea of where the robot might be hiding. And later, he finds the Claremont Airfield, a secluded spot that is popular with the criminal element. The first guard is taken out easily and Batman slips inside. In the large hangar, he discovers the giant robot sitting quietly, and he moves forward into the shadows, planting a scanner on it and radioing back to Alfred. We should take a picture momentarily, sir. What about the vault? Alfred asks, and Batman finds it nearby, commenting that he has almost cracked it. But an energy blast hits him from behind, and Batman is thrown away. Lex stalks forward in his new power armor, grabbing Batman by the throat, lifting him into the air. Of all the gin joints in the world, Batman, why do you keep walking into mine? Lex smiles, promising Batman that Superman won't save him this time. The vault suddenly ticks as the code is broken and it slides open, revealing the head of Brainiac. Hear that? It's the sound of the future, Batman. He continues to crush Batman's windpipe as the Dark Knight tries to explain that Wayne's people already went over Brainiac's head. They found it to be wiped clean. That Brainiac has uploaded his mind somewhere else, but Lex backhands him, pulling Batman close and explaining that even if there are fragments of Brainiac's mind within the head, I can rebuild him. He tightens his grip more, about to squeeze the life out of Batman. But Batman throws a battering knowing that when he went over the Brainiac head, there were still some functions left in it, but no intelligence. The battering hits the right spot in the head's nerve center and the eyes begin to open up. Energy beams shooting out, slamming into Lex. They knock him through the hangar wall and into the nearby plane. Now freed, Batman quickly escapes into the night. Round two, he thinks to himself. Back at the Batcave, Batman tells Alfred to hurry as his faithful friend bandages the man's ribs. I've got to get back out there. 
Alfred expresses his concerns about Bruce's well-being, but the Dark Knight hits a switch and his power armor comes out of the ground. Don't worry. This time, I'm bringing protection. What if he uses the large robot? You said it's indestructible, Alfred reminds him. And he motions to the schematics on the screen, pointing out that the robot is so big that it has room for a co-pilot. But Batman stares at the layout for a moment and then his eyes widen. That's no cockpit, that's a battery. He suddenly realizes, donning his armor, he quickly flies back to the airfield where he discovers that Lex has already left. High over the county, Lex is ordering Mercy to hurry as they are five minutes away from Metropolis. You don't know him. He's relentless. He snaps as they hear a thud on the outside of the plane. They look out front to see Batman hanging onto it. But Lex flies out the door, slamming into Batman and throwing him out of the plane. As Batman turns, he punches Luther hard, throwing him away. Weakened by Brainiac's blast, Lex quickly retreats to the plane, jumping into the giant robot's cockpit. As Mercy jumps clear, Lex explodes out of the plane, launching himself at Batman. There's no way you'll escape, Batman! He shouts, but Batman turns, hitting him with a kryptonite blast that electrifies the suit. Suddenly, a blast of heat vision erupts out of the robot's chest. Superman breaking free. Bellowing in rage, he quickly scoops up Lex and Mercy, flying them away to prison. When he returns, he finds Batman among the plane's wreckage. How'd you know I was in the robot? The Man of Steel asks. And Batman explains that it made sense when he saw the schematics and figured out that Lex had turned him into a solar battery. Batman reaches down for the head of Brainiac, handing it to the Man of Steel. Just get rid of this thing. Maybe just toss it into the sun. It's Madman Candy, he tells his friend, and Superman nods, waving, flying away with a smile. Really is a Boy Scout, Batman thinks to himself. Meanwhile, the mysterious man walks through the streets of Gotham, finally arriving at the spot in Crime Alley. This is where it all began, and a man yells at him from an upstairs window, threatening to call the cops on the guy loitering. The man pulls out a pistol from beneath his jacket. Start dialing, tough guy! Let's see how far you get! The mysterious man shouts. The man in the window runs in fear, and the mysterious man replaces his pistol. Walking away into the night, the bat signal shining into the darkness above. A mysterious man walks down the streets of Gotham, ignoring the crime that passes by, because he has a goal tonight. He leaps up on the fire escape, climbing to the roof of a nearby building, and in the streets below, Batman, Batgirl, and the new Robin fight against the raving Clayface. The monster shouts how he won't allow one of his classic movies to be remade. The Bat family surrounds him, and Clayface manages to split into two, with Batman dealing with one of them as Batgirl and Robin chase the other into a nearby alleyway. The mysterious man watching them shifts his position, choosing to watch Batgirl and Robin. He notes the younger hero's anger, something that might both help and hinder him. And as Robin gets too close, Clayface double wraps a tentacle around him, lifting him into the air. Suddenly, our new hero leaps from the nearby rooftop. Looks like you could use a hand or two. Deathstroke shouts as he brings a sword down, slashing through Clayface. He swings again, cutting off the villain's arm. And as Clayface tries to yell, he suddenly spins falling to the ground. Fast-acting sedative. He'll wake up in six hours with nothing more than a bad headache. If Mud can have a headache, of course. Deathstroke helps Robin to his feet, and Batman interrupts them. Deathstroke. That's the codename I've heard associated with a mercenary that matches your description. I think you'd be the first to advocate using a fear-inducing title, Batman. Deathstroke says to the Dark Knight. And with those words, he backflips away, landing on a speeding van. Robin is in awe. And then he turns around as his eyes widen with embarrassment. Okay, he was awesome, Robin tells them. The next night as Batgirl finishes dealing with another villain, she returns to her motorcycle to discover Deathstroke relaxing on the seat. He congratulates her for defeating Roxy so easily. And she turns to him. If you're looking for an autograph, I don't sign them. Batgirl tells him as she jumps onto her bike and Deathstroke realizes that the woman doesn't trust him. So he removes his mask, hoping that revealing his face will gain some trust out of her. He tells her that he admires her and Robin's skill, believing that Batman has trained them both well. But there is far more work outside of Gotham for her and Robin. I'm fine where I am. Are you? For example, are you aware that you're being watched? He asks as he motions to the rooftop where the mysterious stranger is watching. He knows. He knows. The man gasps as he looks at them, quickly turning and leaping into the shadows. The next morning, the family sit around the breakfast table as Barbara tells them about Deathstroke, and the mysterious stranger. With Deathstroke, stay away from him until I learn more, Bruce orders them. 
Meanwhile, in the middle of the city, Deathstroke is leaping through the skylight, moving against the training dummies quickly and firing his pistol, taking out a few with his sword. But he misses one, and his partner Sonny manages to shoot it. With training, Dunny congratulates her on the plan to use Clayface to draw the Bat family out. However, we aren't the only ones with eyes on Batman and his team. As Deathstroke explains the mysterious man, she asks if he knows who it is, but Deathstroke shakes his head, commenting that there's always room for one more on the kill list, whirling and stabbing his sword into the dummy of Batman nearby. The next night, Robin speeds down the road on his motorcycle, complaining to Alfred that Batman decided to pull the curfew cord when they were going after the Wonderland gang. Alfred reminds him that it is a school night, so Robin looks up to see Deathstroke leaping across the rooftops. He promises Alfred he'll be right home, and screeches off down the road. As Deathstroke is descending into the darkness of Gotham Zoo, Robin calls out, What, you like bugs so much you couldn't wait until opening hours? Deathstroke turns congratulating the boy for getting the drop on him. But next time you might want to lead with a weapon instead of a quip, if you're serious about defeating your enemy. Slade informs him, so Robin jumps down questioning if they are enemies. Allies, you've inserted yourself into my business here, so you're under my protection tonight. He explains to the boy that he is hunting fireflies. A man who has had a crazy accident in Germany and burned himself beyond recognition and since then he has grown crazier and deadlier. And as they move through the building, Deathstroke tells Robin that Firefly always breaks into a zoo when he arrives for a job and collects rare insects. And suddenly, he stops the boy with a raise of his hand. Do you hear that buzzing? Move! And with that, a hornet swarm surrounds them. Meanwhile, Batman stands over the defeated Wonderland gang and out of the corner of his eye, he sees the glint of binoculars. Batman moves fast, leaping into a nearby staircase, jumping through a window, getting to the location of the mysterious stranger. But he's gone. Batman checks the roof's door, but dust shows that no one has used it recently. How did it leave so quickly? Batman wonders to himself. But back at the zoo, Robin and Destro continue to leap away from the swarming hornets. Robin has an idea, pulling off his cape, swirling it around, grabbing the hornets in the fabric. He then leaps down, grabbing the nearby fire extinguisher, blasting the hornets with it, making them too heavy to fly. Not bad, though you might want to think of a more permanent solution next time. But as Deathstroke tells him that, they're interrupted by a blast of fire that hits the ground between them. Looks like I've hit the big time! I've got Interpol so shaken up, they've hired the great Deathstroke to snuff me out! Firefly calls as he flies over their head, shooting flames at them, but a battering suddenly smacks him in the back of the head. Hey, over here, hot stuff! Robin shouts, and Firefly turns on him, readying the flamethrower, but Deathstroke leaps, slashing the weapon out of his hands. As the gun drops, Robin moves in for the attack. Without his weapon, he's an iceberg, he calls to Deathstroke, but the Merc tries to warn him as Firefly opens the mouth of his helmet. Let the kid learn for himself! Call it a baptism by fire! Firefly calls as he begins to breathe fire on the pair of them. They quickly turn and run, with Firefly following closely behind, the flames now shooting out of his gauntlets. He follows Robin, surrounding the young boy with flames, but Deathstroke leaps out of the shadows, kicking him hard in the face. Seems you forgot who your true opponent was. Allow me to remind you! He shouts, and Firefly falls into one of the nearby displays. As Deathstroke turns to see Robin having trouble breathing in all the flames and smoke. Time to get out of the sauna, old man! Hold on! Deathstroke says as he leaps through the air, grabbing the boy, carrying him to safety. He gets him to safety, telling him to stay put until he gets help, and then he draws his sword, stepping out to fight. The sprinkler system goes on and begins to shower them both, but the flames of Firefly refuse to go out. The room suddenly fills with smoke and Batman leaps down into the skylight, his infrared mask easily picking up Firefly's heat signature. In one punch, he cracks his helmet. Oh, you're gonna burn bats next time! Firefly shouts, activating his gauntlets, disappearing into a bright explosion. Robin, Deathstroke, and Batman begin to chase after him, and as Robin tries to say something, Batman snaps at him. Go home! Now! Deathstroke follows the Dark Knight as he stalks away from the scene, apologizing for not telling Robin to leave, and he once again comments on the boy's skill. But Batman shakes his head. You take too much interest in them, Slade. I don't like it. I don't condone assassins, Slade. When you find out where Firefly is, you let me know. You got it. Batman tells him as he turns to leave, and Slade nods his head, joking about a phone number. And when he turns back, Batman is gone. The next morning, Barbara arrives at Wayne Manor, heading down into the cave to find Bruce and Alfred at the computer, still trying to figure out who the mysterious stalker is. The satellite images capture the man leaping from the rooftops and using a micro-thin grappling hook. Bruce is shocked, commenting that the man has extraordinary skill and strength. Elsewhere in the city, the mysterious man pulls on a headset, listening in on Slade's conversation with the bug that he planted in their hideout. Sonny looks up at Slade, his face bruised and swollen where Batman punched her and cracked the Firefly helmet. 
You never said we'd be facing him this soon. She comments, unhappy. But Slade shakes his head, telling her to just think of it as practice. Yeah, tell him. She motions to a video call as Slade steps onto camera, bowing before Lex Luthor, but Luthor isn't happy, believing that Slade would just kill Batman and not put on a whole production with a fake Firefly. The mysterious man's eyes widen as he hears Slade's next words. Patience, Luthor. In the next 24 hours, we'll be making toast to the memory of the Batman. I'm holding you to that, Slade. Don't disappoint, Lex says before ending the call, and Sonny is surprised by Slade's promise. The less time he has to think, the better, Slade tells her as he turns and looks at the Firefly armor. You better get this hammered out tonight. We got a big payoff coming. That night, Batman leaps down to the GCPD because the bat signal was turned on to discover Gordon and the others unconscious. He's fine, they all are, it's knockout gas. Deathstroke informs Batman as he steps out of the shadows, stepping over the edge of the roof, telling Batman that he'll have to follow if he wants Firefly. Meanwhile, Tim calls Barbara in the library, complaining that Batman has left him behind again, grounding him from his previous adventure with Deathstroke. Barbara understands, but informs the boy that she doesn't know where Batman is. As she reaches into one of the nearby books that she's shelving, She's shocked to find a note. It's a trap. Outside, the mysterious stranger quickly puts distance between himself and the library, having left the note for Barbara. Meanwhile, Batman and Deathstroke arrive at the Tri-State Dam, and they quickly discover Lynn's bomb, and Deathstroke is getting to work disarming it, while Batman checks the rest of the place out. Firefly approaches Batman, shouting, Let's make a deal, Bats! I'll fly! You fry! Firefly shouts to him, but Batman leaps off the catwalk, whirling mid-air, throwing an ice bomb at Firefly. Frozen, he falls to the ground, and Batman removes the helmet to reveal the face of Sonny, confirming his suspicions. He's not surprised, as he whirls quickly, avoiding a strike from Deathstroke's sword. He dodges several more attacks, but the Merc slashes him across the back as he tries to leap up to safety. You've gone to a lot of trouble. Surely there must have been an easier way to set me up, Slade. It's not just your death that I want, it's the whole operation! Slade shouts, and Batman tries to leap away, but the catwalk collapses, and he falls to the ground. Slade steps through the smoke, his sword at the ready, as he tells Batman that he'll leave his body burnt to a crisp, and tell the others that he needs to hunt down fireflies to avenge the Dark Knight. Can you imagine your protege's gratitude? I'll have them under my wing in no time, and with them, your entire enterprise! He gloats as he lifts his blade for the killing blow. Two batarangs suddenly fly out, wrapping around him. Yakety yak, and I thought the Joker was a motor mouth. Robin jokes as Batgirl pulls Deathstroke off his feet. This is unfortunate. I liked you both, but I guess a few more heads will have to roll. Batman rolls away, pulling a firebomb from Sonny's fake Firefly chest rig. I told you to leave them alone! He shouts as he throws the bomb at Deathstroke, the fire consuming his suit, but he doesn't feel it. You've only made me more menacing, Batman! But Batman knows that it's heating up inside as Deathstroke tries to strike his blade, creating a blinding light that he tries to use as his escape. But Batman tosses a fire extinguisher, knocking Deathstroke out cold. As he lays on the ground, Batman picks it up and puts out the burning murk. Later in the Batcave, Bruce gets up from where Alfred bandages him, questioning whether Barbara found any prints on the note that was left. She shakes her head, still surprised that this man is staying one step ahead of them. The question is, what does he want? and why the cat and mouse game. Who is our mysterious man? Batman gives chase as Catwoman leaps off of the rooftop, wondering whether Tim is right, and he chases her for longer than he really needs to. But as he manages to grab the jewels that she stole away from her, Selina turns, blowing him a kiss, continuing to run. She doesn't get far though, as a bolo wraps around her body, and as she begins to fall, a new mass hero leaps out, catching her. Batman quickly follows, hooking his grappling hook to a water tower and leaping after them, but the stranger draws a flaming sword, cutting through the water tower supports. Batman begins to fall again, but manages to catch himself and swing away. In the nearby alleyway, the stranger drops Catwoman to the floor. Who are you? A substitute member of the Bat Gang, or just a wannabe? She asks, and the masked man lowers his flaming blade to her. I am of the Order of Saint Dumas. Where is the shawl? He demands, and suddenly a battering is thrown, knocking the sword out of the warrior's hand. He leaps at Batman, punching him, demanding that he stay away. But Batman dodges, and the two begin to trade blows back and forth again. Suddenly, Batman throws down a smoke bomb, forcing the warrior to run as he begins to cough. You are always a trickster! Next time! Batman returns to Catwoman with her brushing him off, and he takes her hand. It's a vengeful god who rules the Order of Saint Dumas. You better tell me. 
Otherwise, there will be no rest for you. He pulls her in close, asking her, Trust me. And she finally agrees. So a short amount of time passes, and Batman stands by while the GCPD takes her in, promising to put a guard on her when suddenly his comms buzz and Alfred's voice fills the air. Pardon me, sir, but your presence is requested at home as soon as possible. When he arrives, he finds Jean-Paul Valley there, an old associate and friend from when he trained with the monks at St. Dumas. So Jean-Paul removes the Azrael mask and he explains that he is scouring the city for the shawl of Lady Magdalene, and he thought that the costume and armor would make the criminal element fear him. They discuss it for a little while about how Azrael thinks that Catwoman is working with the enemy, but what's decided is that Bruce and Alfred will make a bat ally suit of armor for him, so he looks like an ally, not an enemy. The two of them then find themselves in front of Oswald Cobblepot, a.k.a. the Penguin, with Batman growling at him. All I want is the shawl, Penguin. But Penguin shakes his head, explaining that he only acted as a middleman and the shawl itself is already gone. As they begin to get just a little rough with the Penguin, he calls in one of his goons who steps in and reaches for the two Dark Knights. The strange large bird man picks them both up, squawking his delight. First week on the job and I'm icing Batman on this loser! It looks like I've got a bonus coming, Mr. Wing shouts. But both Batman and Azrael kick out, hitting the man in the stomach, knocking him down. You take out the Birdman, Cobblepot is mine! Azrael shouts as he begins to give chase to the Penguin. Batman doesn't waste any time, quickly dispatching the large enemy and then rushing out to see what's going on. And that's when he finds Azrael holding a bloody Penguin over the edge of a building. He was most cooperative, Azrael tells Batman. Though, of course, since he was Catwoman's employer, the order demands that he must suffer in her place. And with that, Azrael lets Penguin go. He plummets through the air, but is quickly caught by Batman, and when he turns back, Azrael himself is gone. He rushes down to the Batmobile and begins to search for Azrael, knowing that by the time Penguin is able to inform him of where Azrael went, it'll be too late. But at that moment, Alfred chimes in, informing Batman that there's been a grave robbery that might interest him. Later on, Azrael is slipping through the shadows of an Iceland skating rink and finds the shawl draped over a female body. Clearly, my quarry knew of its power, but not of its limitations. At that moment, a blast of icy rays hits the wall near him. I should have known! I understand your grief, friend, Azrael tries to tell Mr. Freeze, realizing that Victor had cured Nora for a time, but her disease came back and ravaged her body once more. I don't need tears, holy man. I need the shawl! He ignores Azrael's words about how the shawl won't heal dead bodies. I won't lose her again! And he raises his weapon, blasting Azrael, freezing him in place. Shortly after, Batman slips into the closed rink, finding a frozen Azrael in the shadows. But Freeze is suddenly behind him, shooting his ice rays. Batman whirls, kicking over the table that Nora's body lies on, and Freeze shouts, reaching for his wife's body. Anger flashes across his face as he vows to make Batman pay, but the Dark Knight throws a battering that lodges into his helmet. It slowly begins to vibrate faster and faster, cracking the glass and shattering it. And Freeze screams out as warm air touches his skin. But Batman picks up the Freeze Ray, encasing Mr. Freeze's head in ice, saving him. He uses the same trick to bust Azrael out of the ice, but finds that his former friend's pulse is almost non-existent. He turns, seeing the shawl that is said to have these healing abilities, abilities that Batman doesn't believe in, but he has no choice grabbing it and wrapping it around a former ally. Later, at the Church of St. Dumas, Batman lights a candle for Freeze and Nora. You surprised me, Bruce. There's a passion behind the grim facade that you've adopted. One might almost call it saintly. John Paul notes as he walks across the church to return the shawl to its rightful place. I owe my life to you, and the shawl, of course. The two turn and they walk out of the church with Jean-Paul promising that he won't be as impulsive next time. If you need me, just call. Elsewhere in the city, our mysterious stranger is looking through his binoculars watching the Joker play solitaire in his secret hideout. In the deep city of Gotham, a mysterious stranger is looking through his binoculars watching the Joker play solitaire in his secret hideout. But the Joker glances out the window before turning back to his newest thug, the super soldier known as the Straight Man. It appears that we have a visitor, Straight Man. Someone perched atop the Ferris wheel, Joker tells his comedian sidekick as he continues to curl a crazy amount of weight. The two share a joke back and forth before venturing out into the night. Our stranger pulls up his red hood and prepares to leap down, but the Ferris wheel begins to shake as the straight man hammers one of the struts with a massive hammer. The stranger has no choice but to leap away, landing into a roll, firing his pistol at the goon, but the round does nothing and he dodges out of the way of a Ferris wheel cart. Beep, beep! 
The Joker shouts as he drives by with a bumper car throwing a grenade. The stranger managing to dodge away as the clown and his goon drive off into the night laughing. A short while later, Batman joins Commissioner Gordon and the other cops in investigating the scene, with Gordon telling him that it was the Joker. But Batman discovers the discarded pistol nearby. He wasn't alone. He had a visitor. I'd say offhand, it was a friendly call. And later, as Batman says to the Bat computer, it's both him and Alfred that are surprised by the prince. They belong to Jason Todd. And Alfred's eyes go wide. It can't be. It's impossible. He's dead. You saw it yourself. Alfred tells him, and Tim stalks up, not surprised by what he's hearing, knowing that their mysterious stalker had to be a former member of the team. And he demands answers, but Bruce refuses to explain Jason Todd, pulling on his mask, moving towards the Batmobile. Before he leaves, he stops, and he pauses. Tell him, Alfred. Tell him everything. Batman whispers, and the Batmobile roars to life as he peels out of the cave. So Alfred takes Tim upstairs and tells him the history of Jason Todd. It all started with the Wolves, Alfred begins. The Wolves were a street gang in Gotham City, and they had an initiation ritual where the newest member of the gang would wear a red hood and act as a lookout for their heist. Batman had looked into the events, and he arrived too late for one of the red hoods. This one had slipped from his lookout spot and plummeted to his death. He quickly discovered the gang's hideout, and when he arrived, he discovered that they had already been under attack. Looking inside, he saw a skilled young man fighting off the entire gang. A young man wearing a red hoodie. He went for a fallen gun, and that is when Batman stopped him. And Batman decided to take that young man under his wing. Jason Todd, whose brother had fallen and died when he acted as the Red Hood. Eventually, Bruce accepted Jason Todd into the Bat family, allowing him to take over the spot made vacant when Dick Grayson had left. Alfred and Barbara weren't so sure, as Jason already showed signs of aggression and Bruce refused to allow Jason to put on the costume until he was ready. But Jason broke the rules one night, stealing the costume and joining the Bat family in a fiery battle with the Firefly. The battle quickly ended and the pair returned to the cave to have their own fight. Bruce was furious that Jason would go against his wishes, but Jason won him over. Bruce, I'm not Dick Grayson, I can't be. I won't be. I'm Jason Todd, and I swear that I'll work to honor the trust that you've put in me. All I ask is a chance. Jason said to Bruce as he extends his hand. There was a moment of hesitation, but the two finally shook hands. Things started well enough, but Alfred continues to tell Tim that Jason seemed to enjoy doling out punishment on the more devious of the Batman rogues. Things finally coming to head on Halloween night. You see, Scarecrow had taken over the TV station, using the airwaves to send out a fear-inducing signal to the rest of Gotham. As he shattered a window to hear the screams from below, Jason leaped through the window and kicked him in the face. Batman and Batgirl quickly leaped into the goons, but Robin moved against the Scarecrow, punching him hard in the face. Crane became frightened at the young man's rage, but Robin wasn't listening anymore, pushing him forward to the shattered window as Crane tried to surrender. Since you like to scream so much, we'll let them hear you all over the town. Robin shouted as he punched Crane out the window, with the villain plummeting to the city below. But he stopped short as Batman caught him with a grappling hook. You could have killed him! Batman shouted at Robin after Scarecrow was safely brought back inside. One less oddball! Maybe now the creeps will know that we mean business. Robin snapped at Batman. Back in the cave, Alfred tried to talk some sense into Bruce, knowing that Jason was dangerous. And Bruce finally agreed not aware that Jason was listening to them. Well, at least now I know what you really think of me. Jason shouted as he revealed himself, rushing for his Robin costume. I'm gone! Bruce tried to stop him, but Jason whirled around, kicking him in the face, knocking him back. He then turned, leaping onto the motorcycle. You never trusted me, any of you! He shouted as he roared off into the night. And you never saw him again? Tim asks Alfred. The man nodding, explaining that Bruce had one last confrontation with Jason Todd. Meanwhile, back in the city, Batman steps through the darkened door of the Wolves' old bar. World's greatest detective. Took you longer than I thought. But I knew you'd figure it out eventually. First place we met. It's no Wayne Manor, but sentimental value. You know. Jason told him from the shadows. What happened? Where have you been? Batman asked him and Jason nodded, telling him. I took some time off. I found myself. After recovering from massive blood loss and trauma, of course. <laughs> he turns around, revealing himself. I also worked at a new look. He begins to show Batman his Red Hood uniform. 
Jason, come home. I'm so sorry for everything that happened. I'll do anything to make it right. Extending his hand, asking for the same trust that Jason once did. But Red Hood shakes his head, pointing out that Bruce has gone soft. That he didn't even notice the full bottles of alcohol at the abandoned bar. Especially that they stink of gasoline. He says as he whirls around drawing out his pistol, and he fires, shattering the bottles, starting a fire. Batman leaps to safety and he turns to see Red Hood escaping up onto a rooftop, waving goodbye. Batman moved through the city, finally arriving at Leslie Tompkins' clinic, and there he tells her that Jason is alive, and that he might come here. Emotionally, he's angrier than ever. I thought he might come to you. He always liked you, Batman tells her. Memories flashing through her mind, memories of patching up the young boy, of his wild spirit, and anger begins to fill her as she points at Batman. He was wild and you let him run wild. He wasn't just another runaway kid who disappeared into the night. He was your responsibility. Mine, Alfred's, all of ours. You made us culpable to what happened. She finally tells him to go and Batman retreats into the night. Meanwhile, back with Alfred, he continues the story, explaining that Jason began to work in the city alone, still wearing the Robin costume, but now he was barbaric and angry. He showed no restraint when dealing with Batman's rogues, and it would all come to head when he would use a gun on Killer Croc, putting the villain into the intensive care unit at Arkham for almost a full year. Batman continued to work to track him down, but Jason always seemed one step ahead. Meanwhile, Joker and Harley had had a bit of a falling out, with the two of them apparently having split because of this, because Harley seemed intent on destroying everywhere that she and Joker had gone as a couple. Jason tracked her down trying to stop her and the two fought briefly, trading blows back and forth as Jason dodges her hammer. But finally Jason got the upper hand on her. We both want to be rid of the Joker. Tell me where he is and you'll only wind up in the emergency room. Jason growled at her as he knocked her down, but Joker came up behind Jason, shocking him with the joy buzzer, and the young vigilante fell to the ground. Staring up at the laughing Joker and Harley, Joker reached into his jacket, pulling out a bundle of flowers. Oh, Mr. J, you really do care, Harley says with a big smile, but Joker turns, tossing the flowers onto Jason's body. On second thought, they're more fitting for this young fella. It was a trick, Jason whispers as he falls unconscious. When Jason finally awoke, he was strapped to a table in Joker's lair. Joker smiling as he leaned into the young hero. You've been a busy bird lately, and an unhappy one too, it seems. <laughs> Joker says with a smile. I'll be putting my hands around your neck. Robin snaps at him, but Joker turns to his goons, pointing out all of Robin's hostility. Oh, if only there was a trusted professional that we could call. Harley appears in her doctor's coat, pointing out that Jason is insane and suffering from violent tendencies know his father. I concur, Joker says as he studies the upside down chart. He finally tosses it away, reaching for a crowbar. Junior here has become a real plague to our kind, he says as he begins to hit Jason and then he swings again and again, drawing blood and looks of concern from Harley as he hits again and again until Harley stops him. Fruffing up the punk is one thing, but killing him? Harley asks and Joker turns to her. Did you think that we were going to give him a love tap and let him go? He turns back to the beating, ordering the goons to take Harley out of it. Batman arrives shortly, finding the grisly scene and ordering Joker to step away from Robin. Hey, Bats! Even you've got to admit that that kid was cruising for a bruising! Joker tells him as he drops the crowbar. He turns, ordering his men to open fire, and a nearby hydrogen tank is hit, and the whole place explodes engulfed in flames. Joker races to escape in his car, but another explosion flips it over, trapping him underneath. Batman moves quickly, freeing the wounded Jason. Bruce, I'm dying. I'm all broken up. Jason gasps as the flames roar around them. As he continues to bleed, he asks that Batman finish the Joker. For me, for everyone he's hurt. For everyone, he's going to hurt Bruce. Jason coughs and he hands Bruce the crowbar. Batman stalks over the Joker, but uses the crowbar to free him from the wreck. He moves to help the Joker as Jason is yelling, No! You won't save him! You can't! I won't let you! He shouts as he tips over another hydrogen tank. Batman is forced to flee as another explosion rocks the building. Outside. He screams for Jason, but rushing back inside, he only finds the tattered remains of the costume. Alfred informs him that Bruce returned to the scene for several weeks, searching for any sign of Jason or if he had escaped, but found nothing. They both turn and see Batman at the top of the stairs. 
What happened to Jason was the biggest mistake of my life. And I'll never let that happen again. Not to you, not to Barbara, not to anyone. I promise. Batman says as he walks down the stairs, holding out his hand to Tim. Tim nods, reaching for him. I'd be a sorry excuse for a Robin if I fell for this crap. He snaps as he grabs Batman, flipping him to the floor. Jason chuckles as he removes the mask. Not bad, kid. What gave me away? No Batmobile? He asks, but Tim shakes his head, pointing out that Bruce would never apologize. Alfred pulls out his bolo gun, ordering Tim to get away as he fires, but Jason dodges, and the bolo shatters the costume display behind him. Jason moves, chucking a batarang, knocking Alfred out, and he dodges another blow from Tim, knocking the young boy out. He then grabs the Robin uniform, throwing Tim over his shoulder as he walks out of the cave. Later, Leslie clicks on the lights to her clinic, finding Red Hood rummaging through the meds cabinet. Thanks for the light, Grandma. Hard to read these labels in the dark. The Red Hood tells her as she steps forward, trying to talk some sense into Jason. She reaches for his mask, but he stops her. You don't want to see my face. I've had some work done on it. I'm not as pretty as I used to be. Not as patient either. He says as he smacks her away and continues to try and talk to him, trying to turn him away from his current path. But he pushes her away and heads for the exit. As he walks down the street, he tells her to make a house call to the manor. The old man didn't look too good when I left him. A short time later, she calls Bruce and informs him that Alfred is fine. You were right. There's something wrong with Jason. Save him, please. As she hangs up, Bruce begins to study the locations where Red Hood has been spotted, knowing that he has been hiding within that area, and he finally heads out for the Batmobile with Barbara joining him. Meanwhile, in a secret location, water splashes on Tim's face to wake him up. He struggles to his feet, surprised to find himself in a glass box. Red Hood waving at him, showing him that he took Tim's utility belt. I'm afraid you're completely powerless. If it helps, I know the feeling. Water continues to pour into the glass box as Red Hood turns away. What do you want from me? The breaststroke, or whatever keeps you afloat. It could be a while. Red Hood calls over his shoulder as he leaves. At the Iceberg Lounge, Joker sits with Penguin, asking for a little bit of money so that he can leave the city for a while. Don't kid, Joker. I know what's going on. You got a hitman on your tail, and he's getting close. So close that I'd like to see how it plays out. Poking the clown with his umbrella. But Joker smiles, snapping his fingers, motioning to Straight Man to ask Penguin again. But before the super soldier can move forward, the door bursts open to reveal Mr. Wing. And the two begin to fight, breaking through Penguin's office window and falling down into the nightclub below. As they slam into the floor, Straight Man manages to knock Mr. Wing out. What a team! We're like Abbott and Costello! Joker cheers, but a voice calls out from behind him. Except as always, you're the only one laughing. Joker turns as Red Hood leaps at him, firing sedative darts from his gun. He fires again and again into both Joker and Straight Man, leaping forward and kicking the goon from the ledge and onto the iceberg in the middle of the club. He whirls, throwing a grenade at the chandelier high above, allowing it to crash down on the goon. For a moment, Red Hood glares at the penguin, reaching down, picking up the Joker, turning to leave. Tell Batman Red Hood was here. He should know where to find me. A short time later, Batman and Batgirl investigate the scene, with a very unhappy penguin shouting in their ear the whole time. It's Barbara who notices the wet footprints, and Oswald does remember that Red Hood had a clammy smell to him. Of course. Batman gasps, rushing outside with Batgirl, explaining to her that Red Hood must have taken over Killer Croc's lair. But the woman doesn't respond as Batman turns to see that she has been hit by a dart. He gets into the Batmobile, pulling it out of her back. Another dart hitting him in the chest as he looks up to see Jason in the sewer grate. My last shot, Batman. Just for you. Batman finally wakes up to see the smiling face of the Joker staring at him. Oh, there you are. Hi. Now get me out of here. Joker shouts at him as he holds up his cuffed hands. Batman looks up at Robin, who tells him that he is fine. How long he stays that way is up to you. Red Hood tells him as he stalks down the stairs, nodding to their belt, asking if they should get to it before Robin drowns. You underestimate him. He's used to the pressure. He's been around the block, Batman says to Red Hood, trying to convey a message to Tim. Robin gets it, wrapping his cape around the water pipe into his box, starting to build up pressure. Suddenly, it dawns on Joker who Red Hood is, as he begins to laugh as he picks the cuffs that are binding him. You're the kid that he left to die while he was busy saving me! <laughs> I always wondered what happened to you! Red Hood cocks his head to the side. Really? No! Joker says with a shake of his head. 
He waves at them all as he begins to head for the exit, allowing them to work through their family issues. But Red Hood pulls out his pistol, shooting the clown in the shoulder. With that, he turns and picks up a crowbar from the table and tosses it to Batman's feet. I'm going to give you one chance to fix this. The only way to make this right. Kill the clown the same way that he tried to kill me. Batman shakes his head. You know I won't. Red Hood points to the glass box, telling him that Robin will die, and there's no way to escape. For a weak, immature Robin, maybe. Joker clutches his shoulder. Wow! Quiet! Batman says over his shoulder, but Red Hood isn't done, tossing the Joker his gun, telling him to shoot at Batman so that he can kill him in self-defense. But Joker tosses back the gun. Forcing me and Bats to fight? Nah, ain't no joke in that, bucko! He tells him, laughing at the Red Hood, telling him, This'll never work! If Red Hood shoots the Joker, Batman will take him in and the GCPD will unmask him, which will allow them to figure out who Batman really is. He continues to laugh at the joke of all of it, but stops when he hears beeping in his pocket. Oops, forgot about this thing! He says as he pulls the tracker out of his pocket and Straight Man suddenly springs out of the water, destroying the chamber around them. Planting that homing device in your head was such a good idea! <laughs> Joker cheers as he grabs the gun, preparing to shoot the pinned red hood in the head. But Robin suddenly is behind him, clunking him on the back of the head with a discarded crowbar. He tosses it to Batman, allowing the hero to smack the straight man away. But the goon throws him into the wall, with Batman avoiding another punch. The wall cracks, and the debris begin to knock the straight man away, sending him and the Joker flying away in a torrent of water. Red Hood starts to fall, but the crowbar gets stuck in the wall, and his jacket catches it. Batman reaches out for him, but Jason removes his mask. Bruce, you just don't know how to let me go? Batman tells him that he never will, that he should have come back with him. For how long? Till I can't live up to your code again? Robin calls to Batman as the place is crumbling around them, and Jason nods, ripping his jacket. Save the Robin who needs you, he calls to Bruce as he plummets into the water below. The ceiling explodes and Batgirl reveals herself to them, calling for them to hurry. A short time later, they all stand on the pier, looking out over the bay as the Bat drones search for any sign of Jason Todd. No sign of the Joker or Straight Man, and no sign of Jason either, Batgirl tells him. And Batman looks at them, wondering if he made the same mistake with them that he did with Jason, bringing them into this dangerous life. Jason made his choice just like we have. And we're not going anywhere, both Batgirl and Robin tell him. Later, Jason opens his eyes to see Slade Wilson and Sonny looking down at him. Slade smiles, telling him that he needs to rest, that he has great potential. If it's a safe home you're looking for, look no further. Often, a new family will appear when you need it most. Deathstroke tells him, before leaving Jason alone with his thoughts. The blimp flies over the dark Gotham night as Scarface gets over the radio. He informs the GCPD that if they don't have the money, they're gonna make Gotham look like Chernobyl. If you set off that bomb, you'll kill yourself, Scarface. Gordon points out, but Scarface just laughs, pointing out that he has a chopper incoming. I can see it now! The dummy laughs, and the ventriloquist points out the window. I don't think that's a helicopter. He says as Batman leaps through the window, quickly fighting off Scarface's goons. But in the fight, the timer on the bomb has been activated. It's broken! I can't shut it off! The ventriloquist shouts, and the goons quickly jump to safety as Batman grabs Wesker, leaping out the door. Robin flies by in the Batwing, managing to catch them both in a big net. But in the falls, Scarface falls off of Wesker's hand, plummeting to the bay below. You butterfinger to Brody! He shouts to Wesker as he falls. It's later that Bullock interrogates Wesker, demanding to know where the rest of the explosions that they stole are being hidden. But Wesker just shakes his head, telling him that Mr. Scarface never let him know those details. He thinks I get too nervous sometimes. He explains to Bullock, who gets angry grabbing him. Renee Montoya interrupts them as she walks in, holding the Scarface puppet that they found in the bay. Bullock cheers, grabbing it, throwing it to Wesker, telling him to put it on. Hey, what are you doing here, ratting me out to the cops? Scarface demands of Wesker after he puts on the puppet. And Bullock steps forward, demanding to know answers, only getting the puppet punching him across the face as a response. Batman finally bursts into the room and removes Scarface, with Wesker finally being sent to Arkham Asylum. Months pass and Christmas is fast approaching, with Wesker's release papers finally being signed, giving him a clean bill of health. Elsewhere in the city, Harley shoots another bulb off the Christmas tree, complaining to Poison Ivy that she's bored and that they should throw a Christmas party for all of their friends, though she's hesitant. 
Ivy finally agrees as long as Harley doesn't invite any ex-boyfriends. Snow begins to fall in the city as Wesker walks through the bustling streets of Gotham at Christmas time. He passes a store window, jumping when he thinks he sees Scarface looking back at him, but the toy elves just continue their work. Dear me, I've got to take my medication, Wesker realizes as he walks away. The elves gently whisper, dummy, turning their heads. Above him, Batman and Robin continue to watch the parolee, with Batman telling the young sidekick that they'll keep an eye on him. Holidays can put undue stress on people who live isolated lives. The cops have never located Scarface's stockpile of explosives. He says as they swing away into the night. Meanwhile, Joker isn't happy as he's looking at his computer screen, finding invitations for Harley's party in her hacked emails. She asked everybody but me! Even asked Albert Wesker for quiet out loud. He shouts as he shoots his laptop, but he starts to laugh as Straight Man looks at him. Wait a minute, that could work! He says with a smile as he begins to laugh with maniacal glee. The next night, Batman and Robin are at Arkham Asylum, where the doctor explains to them that Straight Man broke in, knocked around the guards and stole Scarface right out of the evidence room. Batman and Robin turn to leave. Joker wants the dummy for reasons of his own. I'm hoping those plans don't involve Albert Wesker. But when they find themselves outside of Wesker's apartment, they see the former criminal almost looks happy as he's wrapping a present and heading for the door. Seems like he's gonna spend time on Christmas Eve with family or friends? or Robin begins, but then the drone sees Harley's invitation on Wesker's computer screen. Oh, you're not gonna like this, he says as he shows Batman the screen. Batman's eyes narrow. I don't, he growls. At the Iceberg Lounge, Harley meets Albert with a kiss on the cheek. She leads him down into the clump, where Gotham's worst villains gather to spend the holidays together. Be afraid to mingle. I even invited my friends from work, Harley tells him, and Wesker puts his present under the tree and begins to mingle with the rest of the criminals. Outside, Batman and Robin watch from a nearby rooftop. Commissioner Gordon is going to love his gift. All the creeps in one place, practically gift wrapped. Robin laughs, but Batman tells him that they shouldn't sound the alarm just yet. He wants to slip in and make sure the Joker doesn't want to reunite Wesker with Scarface. We need someone inside to make sure that that doesn't happen. Batman says as he steps out of the shadows in a Santa costume. Inside, Harley and Ivy smile as everyone seems to be getting along. You were right about this party, she says with a smile as she hugs Harley. This time of year can be hard for our crowd, hiding on the run away from our loved ones, if we have any. Tonight, you gave us all a place to be and that means a lot. Ivy tells her, and then some of the rogues gather around the piano and begin to sing Christmas carols. I just don't want anyone to be alone, Harley says to Ivy. But the party is suddenly interrupted as Joker comes walking in with Straight Man. Harley storms over to him, demanding to know what he's doing here. But Joker just smiles. We're spreading a Yuletide cheer! <laughs> He walks over, telling them that he brought a special gift and that he'll hand it over to the impartial Santa Claus. Someone call me, Nut Brody says as he walks in. Everyone turns groaning at the worst henchman ever, and he begins to collect presents as Joker tells Brody to start handing out the gifts. And Nut takes Joker's gift and reads the card. This one's for Roxy Rocket, he says, stumbling over the words, and Roxy cheers, but Straight Man pushes her away. Never mind! I'll deliver it! We don't have all night! Joker says with a smile as he takes the present from Brody. I can speed things up, Brody says, beginning to toss the presents out. I'll toss out all the gifts and you guys can swap! He shouts. The criminals all begin to scatter around the room, reaching for any present that comes close to them. Meanwhile, Batman gets on the comms and tells Robin to call in the GCPD. Brody keeps tossing the presents, telling everyone to hurry up since he saw the cops outside. And as the criminals begin to scatter, he reaches for Wesker and starts to lead him out of the building. The nervous man thanks Brody, knowing that the police won't look kindly on him, associating with his old friends. And Brody reaches back into his bag and finds a present with Wesker's name on it. The man thanks him as he heads off into the night, but Brody is suddenly hit in the back of the head as the Joker laughs stepping out of the shadows, holding Scarface. Shame, shame, Santy! Pinching presents! We'll have to make sure that this gets to the rightful owner, he says as he and Straight Man head off into the night, laughing. Wesker steps out of the subway with his unopened present. His excitement at the present diminishes as he sees that it's a festive pair of socks. Oh, socks. A box of socks. Isn't that thoughtful? He sighs as he puts the sock on his hand and begins to talk to it as he moves through the city, finally introducing Tozy to his home. But he's shocked to find Scarface sitting at his desk when he walks into the room. Two time at me already, dummy! I'd blast you right where you're standing if you didn't look so pathetic! Scarface tells him, and Joker and Straight Man come out of the kitchen, pulling the sock off of Wesker's hand, jamming Scarface in its place. 
Shortly, Batman kicks open the apartment door to find the place empty. You bought him socks? Robin asks as he looks at the gift on the floor. I was pressed for time. Batman tells him, looking around the apartment, finding a Joker playing card before they rush back out into the night. Meanwhile, Scarface leads Joker and Straightman to the place where he's hiding the explosives. Their car pulls up to the darkened Santa town. Who's gonna be looking at Santy's backyard? Scarface jokes as he points to a large candy cane nearby. Let me put it this way. There's more than sugar in those candy canes. Ha <laughs> ha! He laughs. A short time later, they return to Joker's hideout where they plan for the New Year's Eve of destruction. Albert Wesker is nervous, believing that they should lay low. But the Joker just laughs, telling the pair that they can stay with him. And then a few days later, on New Year's Eve, Batman and Robin stand on the snowy rooftop of the GCPD with Commissioner Gordon. All I can tell you is that every lead on the Joker went nowhere. We have yet to hear from him or Scarface. He tells the dynamic duo, and Batman nods, but knows that Joker will make his move when the ball drops. Then his comms buzz, and Alfred gets on the line telling him that they've tracked it down Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn. Harley walks into their apartment, surprised to find Ivy tied up by Batman and Robin. You and your stupid party, Harl. Ivy sighs, and Batman stalks forward, demanding to know where the Joker is. But Harley shakes her head, telling the Dark Knight that she doesn't want anything to do with the Joker. He can rot in that stinking ha-ha shoot! She begins to rant, but then she realizes that she gave it away. Gee, Harls, that was fast even for you, Ivy tells her. When Batman and Robin arrive at the abandoned store, they find it completely empty. But Batman notices a subway ticket from the station near Wesker's apartment. They rush out as he tells Robin that he thinks that Wesker left it behind as a clue. I sure hope so. It's only 45 minutes until midnight, Robin tells them as they head back into the snow. At the station, Joker, Straightman, Wesker, and Scarface all load up onto their trolley car. The explosives all around them. Joker steps off, continuing to set the explosives on all of the support struts. And Scarface looks it down at the clown, wondering about the ransom and how they're gonna get away. Oh, about that. I never actually made those calls. That's your game. All I care about is the joke. Joker tells him as he steps forward, squirting his flower in Wesker's face. The ventriloquist stumbles, falling off of the platform, landing on the tracks, but Batman and Robin suddenly appear in the subway station. Save Wesker. I get the others. Batman shouts to Robin, and Joker jumps onto the trolley car, preparing to escape, but a well-placed battering takes out the controls. Not funny, Batman! Ah! Joker shouts in anger, with straight men jumping forward, swinging at Batman, knocking him onto the tracks. But Batman manages to roll away just as another subway car comes screaming at them. It slams into Straight Man, carrying him away as it rolls through the Joker's trolley. Robin manages to push Wesker out of the way, making sure he's safe. You okay, Mr. Wesker? He asks, and Wesker nods as he looks down at the shattered remains of the Scarface dummy. I think so, but poor Mr. Scarface. He sighs. Batman and Robin lead him up to the street, and Batman explains that he called Gordon and told him where to find the Joker, and that they deactivated the bomb. This is all my fault. If I hadn't let Mr. Scarface take over. Wesker begins, but as they reach the street, sounds of cheering and celebration of the New Year meet their ears. Batman looks at him, telling him that the clue that he left behind is what allowed them to stop the Joker. It's a new year, Mr. Wesker. Robin reminds him. Albert smiles and begins to walk away into the celebrated crowds. It is indeed, he whispers to himself, happy for a brief moment. And there you have it. The season one of Batman the Adventure continues. Now, I've considered doing season two, but these honestly didn't do that well. So if this full story does really well, maybe we'll consider getting back to it. I hope you guys enjoyed this today, and I'll see you next time right here at Comic Story.